Friends, the fall is here. I mean, it isn't for me because we don't have fall here. However, for everybody else, it is the fall season. And I associate this time of year with all things cozy. I would thrive in fall and winter. And yet the two seasons I get are summer and tropical rain season. And there is no cold. There is no falling leaves during this time of year. And the fall season for me screams fantasy. As I know it does for a lot of you guys. We've had these conversations in like comment sections and Patreon. Patreon and discords and live shows where we all kind of save those fantasy books that we're really looking forward to for this time of year. And again, while a lot of people associate the fall with spooky stuff and thrillers and horrors and these spookier reads, I associate it with all things cozy. A warm drink, a nice little blankie, the falling leaves, a nice little ASMR ambiance in the background, which is why I have compiled a list of 10 books that to me, when I was reading them, gave me the coziest vibes. And for the most part, these are all fantasies save for one, but I thought I'd bring you guys a cozy fall book recommendation video because I see a bunch of these lists floating around and the ones I've seen are really, really spooky heavy. And as a person that doesn't necessarily love to read spooky stuff because it really does spook me, I thought I'd bring you guys something that was fantasy forward. Pausing this real quick, friends, to give a massive shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Bellway. If you guys have been tuning into the latest video, than you might have been able to see, but I have been on a huge journey lately to build healthy habits. And one of those habits is to make sure that my gut is healthy. Gut health is super important because it connects to so many other things like your digestive and immune system, heart and brain function, and more aesthetic things like your hair, your nails, your skin. And overall, I'm just trying to make sure that I am treating my body kindly. And that is where Bellway comes in. They as a company create organic, all natural, vegan, keto, paleo-friendly, and gluten-free fiber supplements to make sure that your fiber intake goes up because the average person doesn't consume enough fiber. As of late, I've been taking two of their supplements on rotation, the first one being their Super Fiber Plus Fruit Powder. This is especially cool because it has psyllium husk, which helps nourish your gut, it helps reduce bloating, and it also helps you keep healthier blood levels, in particular relating to your glucose and your cholesterol. Not to mention that it's made with real fruit, so it actually tastes like pineapple and passion fruit. Aside from their Super Fiber and Fruit Powder, they also have other powders, like their super fiber with collagen or their super fiber with greens. And they also have got capsules. So they've got a little bit of everything depending on what you're looking for. But if you're not into powders or capsules, they've also got gummies. These taste so good, you guys. They taste like raspberry lemon. But the coolest thing is that it's a super easy way to consume your fiber on a daily basis. One serving of this contains four grams of chicory root prebiotic fiber. Even the powder has five grams of fiber. If you guys would like to check Bellway out, I will be leaving a link at the top of the description. And they've dropped a special code for you guys so you can use code MEL25 to get 25% off on your very first order. So thank you so much to them for sponsoring today's video. Let's get right into it. And to start things off, I'm starting out with a book that is not only super cozy, but if there's any book that gives me Studio Ghibli vibes, it's this one. I don't give it enough love here on my channel despite having read it towards the beginning of the year. I just simply adored this and I can't wait to see the adaptation because it does have one. I just need to find where to watch it. That's Lonely Castle in the Mirror. This book was so moving, so cozy. Again, the Studio Ghibli vibes were elite in this one. The story sets itself up by having seven teenagers wake up on a night and their bedroom mirrors are shining. But they may or may not know at the time is that if they touch it, they will be transported to a different reality where they not only get to meet each other and escape their lonely lives where they may be struggling with their parents at school, with not having attentive people surrounding them and giving them the support that they need, with suffering great losses as of recent, but they also see this beautiful, luxurious royal castle, but this castle comes with rules. If you stay after 5 p.m., you will be punished, and the whole point of them being there is that if if they solve the mystery that is being posed to them, one of them will get a wish. But at what cost does that come? And how willing are you to protect your own secrets? And I genuinely found this so, so comforting. I think it's very the norm, at least in my life, to have either experienced it myself or to see other people go through it, that kids are invalidated a lot. Kids are not really listened to or taken seriously. Their feelings are disregarded quite quickly as something that is not necessarily valid in comparison to what adults may be feeling around them. And this book 
book places a huge importance into mentioning how valid these are, into exploring these emotions and giving these kids a good outlet so that they can express these, work through them, find ways to move past said feelings of frustration and whatnot. The importance also it plays on teachers is absolutely beautiful. Because let's be honest, kids spend more time at school than they do at home most of the time, say for three months out of the year. And so having good teachers in the system is so incredibly important, not only to make sure that the kids are feeling safe, but to make sure that they have got a good environment and a good outlet to talk to people when their parents might not be available. And aside from both of those things, the sense of found family and trust that all of these characters develop, it's so, so beautiful. It doesn't happen quite quickly because a lot of them are very distrusting and are kind of standoffish. But the more we move into the story and the more we get to know them as characters individually and why exactly they're there and how they made their way there, it is such a moving, emotional story. I just absolutely loved every second of this. Speaking of found family, we are not done with it because honestly, found family is great all year round, but there is just something extra cozy about the notion of finding your people or like the winter fall season. And so Every Heart of Doorway is the next recommendation. And as always, Shannon McGuire doesn't miss with the lyricism, with the purple prose. It's all very beautiful. In this book, children are always disappearing under the right condition. What this book explores is that when they disappear, they go to different worlds. They slip through the cracks and then they go to an alternate universe. And when they come back, they come back changed. They may have different quirks, different abilities, different obsessions. And in this one, we follow Nancy, who has quite recently come back, and she is redirected to Eleanor West's home for wayward children. And Eleanor West basically has a home to bring in all of the kids who have come back because she knows how hard it is to reacquaint yourself with the real world. And there is really nobody that understands you more than the people who also went through this experience. Except that the adjustment period is immensely hard because all the kids want to do, and Nancy specifically, all she wants to do is to go back to the dimension that she came from. However, as any good fantasy novel, this time around, with her coming back, things are different, things are dark, there is a murder mystery to solve, and there is only a handful of people that can solve this, and they all reside in the same house, and the suspects are all in the same house. So you do have a little bit of a mystery element in this one. It's such a beautiful ride, honestly. It's such a good audio, so definitely recommend. More found family, because we can never have enough. Legends and Lattes. You guys already know, I loved this one. I've been recommending it ever since I read it, and it's just the coziest book ever. Like, if I were to recommend the peak coziest book, it'd probably be Legends and Lattes. This literally feels like a cozy video game put into a book format. So we follow Viv, who is an orc, and she is completely denouncing her past life of murder and killings and chasing after monsters and exerting justice, even though she always did it with good intent. She's just tired of the bloodshed, and she decides that she wants to retire. She wants to settle back and just enjoy the rest of her days in the utmost cozy, chill vibes. And she decides that she wants to turn into an entrepreneur and that she wants to open her own coffee shop. Does she know anything about coffee? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does she know anything about running a business? Maybe yes, maybe not. And so she enlists the help of the people that are in the town she goes to in order to help her set up her business. We also get to see a little bit of a love interest with Viv, which is so very wholesome. And truly the strength of the book, a lot of people would argue, myself included, is not only Viv's sense of reinvention, which is so beautiful to see. First of all, it's like she is so tired of being perceived a specific way because of the way that she looks or the way that she has acted in the past. And so she is very determined to rebuild a life for herself, rebuild a reputation for herself. But aside from that, the strength of the book really, really lies in the found family aspect because the characters are such a great support system to each other. And it's just very slice of life, but make it fantasy. It's also got super low stakes. So if you don't want to like worry while reading about like, oh my God, this character is going to get murdered. You can really just read Legends and Lattes and know that everybody's going to make it, know that it's going to be super low stakes and that you're not going to have to stress throughout it. It couldn't be a fall book recommendations video without putting in Divine Rivals. As you can tell, these are all books that I've read this year because I wanted to contain the list to things that I have read more recently. Divine Rivals is definitely one that I think is read perfectly 
at this time of year. So we basically follow Iris and Roman, who are both journalists. They are actually both competing for the same spot at the cassette that they work in. Not only is there conflict between them, but there is also conflict outside of this gazette. In fact, the gods had been sleeping for centuries and now they are awake again and there is war. And Iris's brother has enlisted in said war to help the efforts in keeping everybody safe. And because of it, Iris starts writing letters that she supposes are actually getting to him, but they are getting to Roman. And lo and behold, like any good fantasy romance, they start corresponding with each other without knowing that it is each other they are talking to. I don't know how the audio is for this one. I've heard that it's quite good, so it may just be a good audio for you to check out. The connection that is built between Iris and Roman is so good because more so Iris than him is so standoffish to the idea of being together because she doesn't believe A, that he can like her. It's like, how is it even possible? But two, the fact that she isn't at first quite sure whether she likes him because she finds him attractive and they're connecting emotionally or because of the feud they've got going on academically because they do rival each other intellectually. And seeing her kind of move past all of that doubt internally and also move past all of the doubts of whether she wants to be in a relationship, is worthy of a relationship, and then him being so assured in all of that, he is so much more sure than her. It really screams, he fell first and he fell harder. There is such a huge sense of urgency in everything that is happening because there is no promise of tomorrow. It's either today or today. And it's not a book that shies away also from the mentions of war. Like it shows you how crazy it is, how bloody it is, how absolutely painful it is for everybody involved. And because of all of the sense of urgency and the landscape that they are in, there is almost this intense need for human connection and for making friends and keeping friends and, and being in a relationship and getting married and potentially having kids. And we get to obviously see all of that. I love this book so much. Rebecca Ross never disappoints at this point. Please don't go for me, but how much would you guys hate me if I recommended Withering Heights? Listen, I read this a few months ago and I have yet to talk about this on my channel, but this has got to be one of the best classics I have read. The audiobook, like the Audible original audiobook. Oh my God, such a great way to consume the book because the book is so conversational. It makes for the perfect audiobook. So the book starts out with Lockwood who is seeking shelter at Wuthering Heights and as he gets there he meets good old grumpy absolutely done with life Heathcliff and he's very confused as to why Heathcliff is as grumpy and as insufferable as he is right off the get-go. He is told the story of Heathcliff and Catherine. How exactly Heathcliff got to Wuthering Heights and exactly how him and Catherine went on this downward spiral of obsession and love and toxicity and how the losses he suffered through basically turned him into what he is now. And with Nelly narrating most of the book, it makes for such an interesting experience because she has got reasons of her own to dislike the Lintons and the Earnshaws and the Heathcliffs of the world. And so it puts into question kind of everything she is saying because everything is word of mouth. It's two, three people removed so you can never really know for certain whether somebody is embellishing, if somebody is lying, if somebody's changing the story for the sake of their own benefit. But truly, there is nobody in this book that is truly good, which I think makes it in turn such a fascinating reading experience. And even then, the construction of Catherine and Heathcliff's characters, yes, they are both horrible, and yes, they are probably the worst people for each other. They are both products of their environment, with either Catherine being told that she is the most perfect, luckiest girl alive, even that she deserves the absolute world and that's sort of conditioning her to be very demanding and very bratty about anything and everything that she wants. She feels very entitled to things because of the way that she grew up and then Heathcliff being continuously told that he is worth nothing, that he doesn't have any real value and so the people surrounding him not only being immensely classist but also being very, very macro and microaggressive towards him because Heathcliff is not a white man. They are both in their construction so fascinating because you can't necessarily argue that they're horrible just because, but really their surroundings, the people, everything conditioned them to get to the point where they were at at the end of each of their stories. So heartbreaking too as well towards the last third of the book, especially with seeing Heathcliff in present time and how he is behaving with the second generation in particular. So many conversations also about generational trauma and how it can be perpetuated 
graduated. It was just so, so good. So many things to talk about really that two, three minutes in a recommendation video will not do it justice. Caravelle and Once Upon a Broken Heart, anything Stephanie Garber, I think is perfect for fall. I pulled out Caravelle initially because I was like, yes, Caravelle is kind of where everything begins and it's kind of a good place to start. But if you've already read Caravelle and haven't read Once Upon a Broken Heart, then this also counts as a, as a valid recommendation. Also, if you want to pick and choose, you can start with either of these. So these kind of reside in the same world. However, they focus on very different stories and you don't need really, even though a lot of people would argue that you do, you don't really need the context of Caraval for Once Upon a Broken Heart. I actually read this first and its sequel before I even touched Caraval and I understood this just great, just fine, perfectly without this. So starting with Caraval, in this we follow Scarlet and Tela who are sisters and they have a super strict father which is why they are seeking their escape. They don't want to be around him and Scarlet in particular has been very obsessed with Caraval for a really long time. She has been reaching out to its master for ages and ages in the hopes to get an invitation to attend Caraval, see it for the first time, and lo and behold, they get the opportunity to go. Tella enlists the help of a sailor, and then they all go together to Caraval, except that Tella goes missing, and then Scarlet has to play the game and find her sister before it is too late. It's a super quick read. The world of Caraval is so fascinating, and the games are quite interesting because it pushes, obviously, every bound of reality, and half the time the players don't know if what's happening is true, if it's not true, and that's kind of the whole trick of the game. Never think it's real, because it never is. But what happens when it is or when it could potentially be? So it kind of messes with your brain as you play, and the stakes are always super high, like you can die at Caraval, and there are magical deals happening that could take your life, and so the stakes are quite high, but I think the book does a great job at mitigating the tension by having all of this beautiful, whimsical writing, so this one's quite good. And then this one has completely different vibes. If you like Once Upon a Time, if you enjoyed the movie Mirror Mirror with Lily Collins, this is a book you could really enjoy. It feels much more whimsical, much more fairy tale-y than Caraval. In this one, we follow Evangeline Fox, who grew up loving stories. Her mom always told her all of these different mythos pieces and fairy tale stories and happy, happy endings. And she has grown up with the idea that she wants her own happy ending. She is in fact in love, but her love is not going as expected because said love she has is marrying somebody else. And so she strikes a deal with Jax to give him three kisses that he can do whatever he wants with. He doesn't want them for himself, but rather for magical purposes in exchange for breaking up this wedding and returning her love to her. Things don't necessarily go as planned because they never really do. And the story goes from there. And what we see in the world of Caraval with fates and with the decks of Oracle and with all of these different pieces of magic is well, well expanded on this one. So if you like mentions of deities and fates and loads and loads and loads of magic in a way that is much more overt, I would say Once Upon a Broken Heart is where it's at. Both of these are great recommendations for the fall. One of my most recent reads, but I couldn't not recommend this, My Roommate is a Vampire. I adored this book so much. It is honestly the coziest thing I've ever read. I also love how much like Legends and Lattes, no stakes at all. So in this one, we follow Cassie, who is a struggling artist, and because of it, she can't pay rent, and she is being evicted. And in the midst of trying to find somewhere to stay in Chicago, which is quite expensive, she finds a super odd listing for an apartment that is super luxurious, fully furnished. She will be renting a room, though, but it's still quite cheap, cheaper than it ever should be. And she's a little bit suspicious of it, but she does go investigate to see if this is a potential place she could stay at. She goes meet the person who is renting said room, the owner of the apartment who is Frederick and she decides that this is actually quite a good place to stay in so she does and the one thing she doesn't know is that he is a vampire. The whole reason to seek out a roommate was not because he needed the money but because he wants to learn more about the current world, the modern world. He wants to know how to properly use a cell phone, how to run the tv, how to navigate a coffee shop, and how to talk to people on a daily basis without standing out. And it is so very wholesome truly seeing a vampire who is out of their time and who has 
has no idea what he is doing half the time was so endearing. I used to read, <laughs> maybe exposing a bit much of myself, but I used to read a lot of Steve Rogers fan fiction, Captain America fan fiction. And a huge part of that fan fiction was Steve getting reacquainted with the real world because obviously he's been an icicle for like a really long time. And it's kind of similar to this, which is why I think I loved it so much because he just wants to appear normal. He just wants to lead his everyday life without seeming suspicious, but he is so, so clueless. This man literally buys her a whole Le Cousset set of pots and pants. I also want to be a vampire to get me a whole Le Cousset set. I also want one. And then she in turn is obviously navigating her own struggling artist life and figuring out what she wants to do with her art pieces. If she wants to continue teaching under what conditions she wants to teach because she does kind of like it, but it not having the payoff that she would have expected. And their romance is so, so very sweet because they're very communicative, which is incredible. And conflict doesn't really happen in a way that is infuriating in this book, which I quite appreciate. And there is also the element of notes in this one because they communicate through letters and like post-its that they leave on the dining room table for each other. And so if you like the element of letters as well, this is something that you also could enjoy. And it's so very cute. I don't know how to justify this one, except that I need everybody to read it. Love Theoretically by Ali Hazelwood. I have only read The Love Hypothesis and this by her, and this is my favorite. So in this one, we follow Elsie, who is a theoretical physicist. She is in fact at the moment an adjunct professor, which is not paying very well. And so she enlists the help of an app in order to make more money, to pay the bills, and survive on an everyday basis. And said app is basically a service where you can hire people to pose as your significant other. In said app, she has a client that is a regular and she is always kind of attending functions with him. And his brother, Jack, is always very suspicious of this particular situation because he doesn't think that this romance is quite real. In fact, he thinks Elsie is messing with his brother and that she doesn't quite love him. And so when she applies to a job at MIT, because that's like her dream position, she ends up meeting the committee that is going to kind of put her through the ringer in order to see whether or not she gets that job. Who is in said committee? Jack. But who also is an experimentalist that if you know anything about physics, there's a huge rivalry at times between theoreticals and experimentalists. And this guy has really made it his job in the past to torment theoretical physicists. The communication in this one is so, so good. There is one small bout of miscommunication and I'd argue it's warranted because how the fuck do you bring that up? It's like such a hard conversation to have to begin with. I love that although Elsie is a bit hesitant at times to really be vocal about the way that she is feeling or the things that she needs because of the way that those needs have not been met in the past and how her feelings have always been pushed aside by her family because she was a parentified child. Jack is always very attentive to that and he's always like, like, listen, this is a space we've built for ourselves. You need to be able to express yourself and talk and communicate the way that you feel and the things that you need because otherwise, how am I supposed to know these things? And so I love the mature conversations that happen time and time again in this book because they were very open and vulnerable with each other in ways that I perhaps haven't seen other characters in romance books communicate before. And so their connection because of it, I think seemed so much more real to me. It was such a healthy romance overall that I quite quite enjoyed. And so I'm just saying, Love Theoretically is here to help with the fall vibe, super cozy romance. And I'd argue it's Ali Hazel, it's best work yet, but I've only read two of her work, so who am I to know? But still going to say it. Villains Are Destined to Die is another one I'm recommending because it's all good. I've literally read the first two volumes already. The third one is on its way to me and I love this series so, so much. So this is a manhwa, which is a Korean graphic novel. And we basically have an isekai moment, which means that a character goes into a world that is other than their own. And so we observe our main character go inside a video game whose whole point is to earn affection points in order to win. However, the game has two modes. Easy mode where you play as the heroine, Yvonne. It's super easy to make everybody fall in love with you, so winning again is quite easy. And hard mode where you play like Penelope Eckhart, who is the villainess, who loses affection points quite fast because she can't 
never say anything right. And so she is killed by the love interest quite quickly because of it. And so our main character has played the game before. She kind of knows part of it, but she's never actually won as Penelope. She's never won in hard mode. And so it's quite cool to see her navigate this game as the villainess, who is not really that villainous. It's just the fact that she has been mistreated her whole life. So she is a byproduct of her environment because she kind of knows what happens, but at times she doesn't. And so it's always a toss up in terms of what will lose her affection points, what will win her some. And to me, like the biggest question is if she loses, if she dies, like what happens? Her life is so similar to Penelope's that it kind of brings up the question, was it a random bout of like, you just went into the game because you relate it to the character or is there like an actual reason? And like, how did we get there? And I can't wait for the newer volumes to come out because I need more. I am a greedy motherfucker and I need more. And then last but not least, Vespertine, which I would argue if not read during the fall, then when? It is so great for this time of year. Also, the audiobook is quite good. So we definitely recommend. It's very whimsy. It's very magical. And honestly, the way that she is able to build the world in a set amount of pages, which is, I think it's like a little bit over 400 pages. It's so perfect. Margaret Rogerson has just a great ability to be very intentional in her writing. And I loved it in this one. You've got an animal companion in the form of a raven called Trouble. You have got a sort of malignant spirit <laughs> that possesses the main character, but is actually quite endearing and wholesome. We follow Artemisia in this one who is training to be a gray sister. That is a nun who cleanses the bodies of the dead so that they can move on peacefully, but bodies in this world don't really go peacefully because depending on the way that they die and their bodies are cleansed or not, they can stay in said world and they manifest themselves as different spirits. So depending on the way you die, you quite literally rank differently and that dictates what you're able to do or not do and how you manifest yourself or not, which is quite fascinating in terms of like world building. The convent that she is training at gets attacked by possessed soldiers. And as everybody is being killed, she is told to flee and protect a saint's relic, which holds a revenant, which is a form of a malicious spirit in order to keep it safe because they can't let that get into the wrong hands because then that means extra dire things. And so she runs with it and she is actually able to use it. She is able to allow the revenant to kind of possess her and use utilize her body in the ways that it wants, but she is also able to utilize the Revenant in order to enhance her ability to be faster, to be stronger. But it takes a lot of practice to do that. In fact, the only people who are able to do that are Vespertines, which are people specifically trained and tasked to do these things. And that art is lost because there are no Vespertines around. So she has to figure it all out on her own whilst also dealing with a Revenant who wants to consume her completely and possess her body completely. And it's quite amazing that we start out the book with the main character who is very standoffish. She is very socially anxious. She has got a lot of PTSD and she really doesn't want to involve herself with other people. Interpersonal relationships are not her thing at all. And we end the book with somebody who is able to exert boundaries, who communicates very well, who has a sense of found family and she finds her people. And so in terms of character growth, it is absolutely beautiful. Also the magic system is on like anything I've ever read before and like trust Margaret Rogerson to do something that's like quite quite different but I don't think I've ever read about killer nuns and religious systems being used to expand and build in general a world. It's just quite fascinating. I will say if you have like some sort of religious trauma, definitely don't read this. But if you don't have any of those things, then definitely check this out. I really enjoyed it. And that is all I've got for today, friends. Those are all of the full book recommendations I've got for you today. So a list of 10 books that again, I think are super cozy and that can really warm you up during this fall season with a nice cozy drink at a nice little coffee shop. I think these would be very, very good options. I'm just saying there is good taste in this household. So give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and comment down below. Do you guys have any books that are perfect for the fall season? Are there any books that you kind of go to every year? Are there any books that you're looking forward to during the fall? Like, do you guys even have a fall TBR? If you reach the end of the video, let's leave some fall leave emojis in the comment section. I think that is very, very fitting because of the video. Subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. And if you want to support the channel further, Patreon is linked down below alongside all of my different socials. So make sure to check all of that down in the description. And there's that, friends. Love you all so much. And I will see you on the next one. Goodbye!